I'm going to start you off with a test, just because that's what teachers do. It's a, it's a pre-test, and I assure you it's multiple choice. You answer to your own satisfaction and score yourself. Hi. Heidi, hello. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, these are not environmentally oriented questions particularly, but um, I have five of them, and take your best, best shot at this. Two okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I was looking at the clock back there, so. <laughs> Very nice. Good to see you. Should we have a paper and pencil? You don't, there will not be a test. No, it's just, you can do this in your head. Okay. I'm just I'm already. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's it. Oh, Proper hi time everybody. To I'm Jamie Stanley. Oh, I'm no. a librarian upstairs. And I, um, Thank you for coming. Yeah, I asked, Jen and I have talked about these things on and off. And I said, you should do a program. <laughs> Let people know about this. So. Well, thanks. Yeah. Hi. You did it at River Bend, Hi. didn't you? Pardon me? You did it at River Bend? I did, yes. I missed that one. Well, <laughs> I, I did it in, Ma in March at River Bend. And since then, there's been more good news. So, <laughs> but um, thank you for the opportunity. Um, as I was saying earlier, I'm going to give you a, a five-item, multiple-choice test. <laughs> you don't need paper and pencil. You answer in your own head. You score yourself, and best wishes. Mm -hmm. Number one, in low-income countries around the world, how many girls finish primary school? 20%, 40%, or 80%? Need a repeat? Number two, in the past 20 years, the proportion of the world's population living in extreme poverty has nearly doubled, remained about the same, or been cut nearly in half. Number three, Today, how many of one-year-old children have been vaccinated against some disease? 20%, 50%, or 80%? Number four, worldwide, 30-year-old men have an average of 10 years of schooling. How many years have women of the same age spent in school? And that would be nine years, six years, or three years. And your last question, worldwide, how many people have some access to electricity? I'm not sure how to define, to define some. Some access to electricity, 20%, 50%, or 80%. Now you can score yourself. And here's the first one. In low-income countries around the world, how many girls finish primary school? 20%, 40%, or 60%? The right answer is 60. In the past 20 years, the proportion of the world's population living in extreme poverty has nearly doubled, remained about the same, or been cut nearly in half. Been cut nearly in half. Today, how many of the one-year-old children have been vaccinated against some disease or another? 20, 50, or 80%? It's 80%. Worldwide, 30-year-old men have an average of 10 years of schooling. How many years do women of the same age have? Nine years, six years, or three, and it's nine. And the last question. Um, how many people have some access to electricity, 20, 50, or 80%, and it's 80? I'm not altogether sure if they mean people who have a street light somewhere that they can go and read underneath, I'm not sure. But those are from a, a book that I found interesting called Factfulness by uh, Hans Rosling. He's, a, um, a, he's done international sort of statistical work. He's quite a character, and this book is a strange read. It came out in 2018, so his numbers don't factor COVID and whatever impacts that they have had subsequently. 
but his subtitle on Factfulness, 10 Reasons We're Wrong About the World and Why Things Are Better Than We Think. And he makes his case in, in this volume. I, I found it interesting and, and heartening. Um, and um, I can commend it to you as a place to kind of look at how you, how, I, I would add this, he provided these questions to well-educated, well-traveled people in many parts of the world. And consistently, they got them wrong. And they got them more wrong than random. So it's not just that they didn't have this accurate information, it's that they had wrong information. And so in, in that context, um, I'd like to spend a little time looking at some environmental issues and seeing if things maybe aren't as bad as they do seem from time to time. First of all, how many of you have recently seen an eagle? Thank you, Rachel Carson. <laughs> things got better because of what she's done. Um, things got better on the acid rain front. Um, do you remember the ozone hole? The 1980s, there's quite an interesting uh, PBS documentary that you can borrow from the local library on the matter of the ozone hole, and it talks about how in the 1920s we began that shift away from ice boxes to refrigerators, and this was thanks to the invention of the chlorofluorocarbons that people used to refrigerate. And, there, there was, and the, the guy who came up with that um, also provided the idea of leaded gasoline. gasoline. Mm -hmm. Seemed like a good idea at the time, apparently. But in any case, this refrigeration process, along with the propellants in aerosol spray cans, proved to be the bad guys on the depletion of the ozone layer. The ozone hole that appeared over Antarctica was increasingly a matter of concern because the ozone layer provides a shield from the ultraviolet rays of the sun. And um, without that shield, there are more instances of skin cancer and there's a negative impact on agricultural productivity. So the effort to address the ozone issue is a, another success story. In Montreal, Canada, there was an agreement negotiated among a large number of countries to replace these um, polluting elements of the refrigeration and the propellant stuff. And among the people significant in those negotiations, Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, not people we often think of as out there in front on environmental issues, but they were uh, important in the negotiations of, of, of that uh, particular agreement. The, um, that's, that's maybe the first item I wanted to bring to your attention. Another one um, was published in the Star Tribune back in December of last year announcing that a polling that internationally indicates that 80% of the people they polled have either a lot or some confidence in science. And that in, in um, uh, the US, that, had, that study had not been done since 1975. I'll just parenthetically say that uh, in the US, when they redid that question about are you confident in science, among Democrats, it was up 12. Among Republicans, it was down 27 points. Um, so, yeah. Uh, but confidence in science has, in general, been improving. Um, sorry, I dropped that. But the um, greenhouse gases, of course, that we talk about more than more than others are, are carbon dioxide and our big effort to reduce those impacts. But more lethal, more dangerous is methane uh, by a factor of 35, I guess. It's more dangerous than carbon dioxide. And um, I only recently came to know that it is produced when I send off to my local landfill my banana peels and eggshells that those, those organic elements 
in, that should be composted, <laughs> if I send them to the landfill, they are generating methane. And another significant source of methane is um, cattle. And they, in the process of digesting food, produce methane, which they belch out. Comes out the front. <laughs> and <laughs> there's, there's an approach that reduces that impact by 98%. And that is if the cattle are fed a diet that contains 0.2% seaweed, that addresses their methane. I don't know how the biology works there. But that is a substantial, by the time you look at all the cattle there are in the world and the methane that they produce from an ordinary diet, it's pretty staggering. And in addition, the people growing and producing seaweed for cattle diets are helping to sequester car carbon dioxide in this process um, because it redu and reduce ocean acidification because the seaweed takes in carbon as its food. The cows seem to benefit by being um, growing more efficiently and producing more milk. Kernza is an, a new agricultural, comparatively new variety of wheat. And uh, Kernza, K-E-R-N-Z-A. And um, it is a perennial, and unlike ordinary wheat, you plant it, you harvest it and wait for it to come back. It'll be back the next year. So there's a, a significant environmental saving just in the fact it doesn't have to be replanted. But it has some remarkable attributes. There are concerns um, about nitrates in well water. And it comes to light that if Kernza is planted around or near wells, it absorbs out of the uh, uh, it absorbs the nitrates that are doing the damage. If they're planted near where runoff is coming from a cornfield, they are preventing 96% of the nitrate contamination. If it's a bean field, it's only 86% that they can prevent. But that particular variety of, of wheat is doing that. And it is uh, really a significant taxpayer issue too because Municipal water treatments, places like Des Moines, have had no end of trouble trying to address getting nitrates out of, out of the water they're providing to their communities. Here in Minnesota, both Hastings and St. Peter have had significant trouble with that and have um, um, been looking for how they can minimize the nitrate impact. Kernza looks to be at least part of an approach that would help on that point. Um, phosphorus, another uh, element that's put out on fields for the, um, to improve the yields, turns out it's in somewhat scarce supply. And the phosphorus that we ordinarily are applying to our agricultural crops is much of it being washed into the Mississippi and ultimately to the Gulf where it is generating the dead zone. Not a good thing. More and over, the phosphorus that we need is almost uh, very significantly imported from Morocco. And their supplies are finite as well. So how about recovering the phosphorus in our wastewater treatment procedures? And the university has done research that has generated a process, um, which they've implemented, I believe, in St. Cloud, They've taken the traditional anaerobic pro or process for, for clarifying the water. They um, have now got a less expensive strategy using bacteria which eat the phosphorus, die, and then uh, it, that is dissolved in a chemical treatment and they recover the phosphorus and it can be reapplied. This whole process is done in one day instead of 30, which is the traditional way, and they recover 98% of it. So I felt good about that. <laughs> that seemed to be an encouraging development. Um, 
as we look at the fact that we're expecting to see wetter and warmer weather here, to say nothing of the fact that we already know of how much uh, really extensive suffering is resulting now from hotter temperatures. There are strategies to provide um, better cooling. And 3M has developed a film that can provide some um, benefit without demanding electricity and therefore reducing costs and greenhouse gas impacts. The film is um, applied to uh, uh, roofs and it's solar reflectivity and thermal emissivity. I love that word. <laughs> thermal emissivity. Uh, has a fluid is piped through um, the panels and the refrigeration system then is engaged on that basis. They say the consumption of energy is reduced by 100 watts per square meter of roof surface. So um, that's something that um, the university has been at work on. Um, on the f energy front, nuclear power. As you know, we're, we're getting nuclear power and have been for a long time, along with the continual concerns about how to deal with the radioactive waste and what kind of risks are there with radioactivity, radioactive materials falling into the wrong hands or nuclear meltdowns. There is, and has, we've known for a long time, that you could also generate nuclear power through fission, not through fusion. Fusion is our strategy now. We split some atoms that generate the power. The fusion process is one whereby uh, two hydrogen atoms are forced together and they generate one atom of helium and energy. And it's the process that the stars are using um, that they can produce 10 times more energy than is needed to do the, the process itself. So it looks to be virtually an unlimited and a non-polluting source of energy. But it's been kind of a pipe dream. I don't know how close we actually are here. But this is an article from September of 2021 in the Star Trib. Um, nuclear uh, massive magnets are involved in the fusion process. And there's been a collaboration among a variety of countries that they have produced a magnet that's strong enough to lift an aircraft carrier, in case you needed to do that. And um, <laughs> they think that, that this is an essential element of potentially generating nuclear power from fusion, and that it could conceivably be um, put out as, as a pilot project in 2026. And um, so there's something that I've been hearing about for years and might actually turn up. Um, more locally, the University of Minnesota has uh, done some research, research on the matter of rare earths. And rare earths are, in fact, rare. We are, find them essential in things like um, electric vehicles, wind turbines, medical equipment. You have to have this rare earth, earths uh, to do those things. And most of it comes from China, where it, it, obtaining that is quite a polluting process in itself. Well, there's now a, uh, some magnets, once again, that have been developed at the university, and there's a, now a, a company that's looking to decarbonize uh, the electricity required in this process, replacing rare earths with these particular magnets, cutting costs quite dramatically. They, they use recy recyclable iron and nitrogen in making these magnets, however they work. It's way beyond my head on that. But, but there's work going forward then that says we can substitute for rare earths and get, get what we need in that category. Um, I want to draw your attention to Costa Rica. Any of you been there? Sounds good. Well, it's an exemplary country in a lot of ways. In 1948, Costa Rica did away with their military. And they committed their funding to public schools, public health, environmental protections, and it's a pretty remarkable place. Um, 
they're, they're using almost entirely renewable energy. Now, I will add, that's mostly hydro. And hydro is not altogether beneficial. You've got to dam rivers to generate hydropower. And that's, that's not ideal. But it doesn't require hydrocarbons in any case. They have doubled the forest co cover in the country in the past 30 years. They have um, um, generated then a carbon sink and provided a great uh, tourist attraction. This is a very popular place for tourist activity. They have a transportation system that is increasingly electric. A third of the buses, <laughs> nearly all of the cars by 2050 will be um, operating on an electric basis. Um, the government there is taking the climate and environment issues, uh, environmental issues quite seriously. An article from the Tribune, March 3rd of this year, the United Nations has negotiated a treaty on plastics in which 150 countries commit to an effort to be actually enforceable at some point that would produce, would decrease the production and the waste of plastics. And coming much closer to home, I wanted to talk some about regenerative agriculture. But at this point, perhaps I should defer to the Haslets. <laughs> As most of us know, uh, Rahi and a Amy have a farm um, just outside of Northfield, which is operating on a regenerative agriculture premise. They're raising chickens. They are using a complex blend, I don't know how complex it is, but it, to me it looks complex, of hazelnut trees, elderberries, and the process is generating healthy soil as well as healthy food. And this, I think, is, is a trend in which our local talent is out in front, and um, it's a source of, of considerable pride to me, I think. Um, also, locally, I would point out that um, the Clean Rivers Partners, recently known as the Cannon River Watershed Partnership, have been working since 2014 on some projects with uh, very good environmental impacts. In, 19, in, in 2014, cover crops acreage here in the watershed was less than 500 acres. It's now over 2,000 acres. The nitrate load, which we wanted to see decrease, is down 42 tons from what it was in 2014. The sediment load, which we also want to see go down, is down by 1,000 tons. And the greenhouse gases are down by 1,500 uh, 1, tons, uh, owing to the, the kind of work that that they have been doing on uh, cleaning up the river. And the, um, the Cannon River uh, health is indicated in some measure by the presence of native mussels. And college students here did a study on native mussels back in 1987. And they found six different species and rather sparse numbers. They did that study again in 2007. I, I don't have more recent numbers, but they found instead of six species, they found 10, and quite dramatic improvement in numbers. And that's a, an indicator of uh, better water quality. So that's, to me, encouraging. And I would add just um, in the, this long list of things here that um, there's now a, con a, a, a a very recently generated interest in peatlands, or at least recent as far as I've been aware. A big spread on this just in um, um, the paper on Sunday. And we have peatlands here in Minnesota. I blush to confess that I have a bag of peat moss in my garage, but I won't buy another one. And um, it's being mined for purposes like that. It's been, historically, peatlands have been drained in order to get better ag opportunities. And that's been a really um, very regrettable development. The dried out peatlands are flammable, big time, and the wildfires are uh, just amplified dramatically when, when there's 
a dried out peat acreage involved. And they are, when they are wet, as they should be, they are carbon sink and a more effective carbon sink than forest. Uh, I'm told this by the Nature Conservancy in collaboration with U.S. Fish and Wildlife. Um, there's, with, with the loss of peatlands, the, um, the increased uh, dispersal of CO2 into the atmosphere and the wildfire risk, once restored, they are so significant in sequestering CO2. And some, someone is working out a process through which private landowners who, have to, who want to protect or restore peatlands can actually quantify the amount of uh, CO2 that's, that they are impacting and get a credit which is a, a saleable commodity, the, you know, the carbon cr trading concept. So that, that's, that's something that, that can be done. Well, there are more of these things, but I'm not just <laughs> going to continue to rattle them out. I found, to my great delight, that if I'm looking for good news, I can find it. And um, if I wasn't looking, I'm sure I'd miss a lot of it. But it, it's out there. Most of what I got was in the business section of the Star Tribune. And things that I got from public radio or public TV, I didn't use because I couldn't write them down fast enough and you know, kind of document them. But there, there, are good, there are good things happening. And I, I hope that's the real takeaway from this evening that you would recognize that people are working on this, there's some progress happening, and while it looks very uphill at times, um, there, is, there is potential. I wanted to bring to your notice um, some of the books that are mentioned on the, the handout that Jamie provided. Um, one called Under the Sky We Make by Kimberly Nichols. She's a climate scientist, and this is a very readable volume. It's kind of a memoir about how her personal and professional life kind of come together as she, as she looks at climate issues. She talks about a colleague who spoke at a, um, a session about climate, and, and when she'd finished, one of the people in the group approached the scientist to tell her, well, this sounds like a very serious issue, but I don't know that it's very serious to you. And, and she said, well, you know, it made me realize that as a scientist, I was trained to be quite clinical and detached. Mm -hmm. The same thing happened to the people who were working on the ozone. They came up, they, you know, we're supposed to say, we've got this problem with ozone, we've researched it, it looks like these refrigerants and propellants are the problem. Do with that what you will. Well, <laughs> some people began to say, well, let's, let's, get rid of and replace these kinds of products. The people producing those products took exception. And in fact, went after these scientists big time. They said, you're agents of the KGB. <laughs> Rachel Carson had more than a little static from the people producing DDT when she made her recommendations. There is, I think, an ongoing issue for people in science as to how to work the, the fine line between knowing some things that are important for everybody to know and how to convince people that certain kinds of changes are needed. Um, they don't see, a, a, a scientist would generally tell you, it's not my job to be talking policy, but they are increasingly doing that. I'm, I'm, I'm gratified, personally. Um, <laughs> Nichols I, <laughs> has got now, this much of her book is, is uh, source citations of one kind or another. <laughs> but she has provided, <laughs> I just love this, um, she has provided seven pages at the end that are labeled TLDR, mm -hmm. too long, didn't read. <laughs> <laughs> and she bullet points the points she's made, <laughs> made through the book. <laughs> So she's given us the Reader's Digest version 
of Under the Sky We Make. Her, her message is just this. It, the climate's warming. It's human-caused. We're sure about that. This is serious. We can fix it. Bottom line, we can deal with it. And she it ends on that conviction that, yes, it's, it's a solvable pro problem. Another writer in that vein is uh, Catherine Hayhoe, Saving Us, a climate scientist case for hope and healing in a divided world. She too, very readable, very engaging. I would say her bottom line is talk about climate. Talk about climate to the people you know. And um, I think that's, I find myself thinking, I grew up with the thought that was not the, in the best of taste to talk about religion or politics with people, unless you were on quite intimate terms with them. Um, I've come to the point where I'm ready to talk about either of those things <laughs> with anybody who doesn't run away fast. Um, <laughs> but her point is, talk about climate. People need to process the things that they're hearing about it and need to get the message that these are not insoluble problems. They are problems that need prompt attention, but they are not things about which we are utterly helpless. Another of the books I would commend to you is Nature's Best Hope by Douglas Ptolemy. Uh, he, his motif is conservation in your own property. If you own any, any real estate, his message is Go for, a, for native plantings. Uh, reduce the amount of turf grass you're mowing. And that through that, the, the biodiversity is dramatically improved. That with, with minimal kinds of changes in private landholders, there can be um, really good uh, restoration of, for example, the, the bees. I, in my own yard, I let no mo may happen. And by the time I was out there on, in early June, there were a lot of bumblebees out there. I thought, this is working. This is good. I have mowed since, but I think they were big enough to fight it off. Um, but, but there's one who says that if you've got property, you've got potential for doing things. He said if, if residential people converted you know, a fourth of their acreage, we'd have more uh, native habitat than we have in all of our parks, national and state parks combined. And in that connection, I would just mention too one of the one of the clippings I haven't used is big news that the butter the monarch population in California had a dramatic increase, huge. And I would add that I see people around town who are letting their milkweed grow, which is gratifying. And, um, happy about that. Um, I'm going to end here shortly, but I wanted one more book to come to your notice. This is uh, not on your, your handout. This is a book by Scott Russell Saunders, who is a professor of English at Indiana. And his book called A Conservationist Manifesto is essays about environmental issues. And um, I have found this to be um, a great value and inspiration to me. But I wanted to read you just a concluding paragraph from an essay he wrote called For the Children. And he's writing uh, to an imaginary child. He's sitting out in his backyard and writing about a child of the future. And he's talked about how much the, the natural world has meant to him in his own life. He concludes with, with this. Thinking about you draws my heart into the future. I want you to look back on those of us who lived at the beginning of the 21st century and know that we bore you in mind. We cared for you and we cared for our fellow tribes, those cloaked in feathers or scales or chitin or fur, those covered in leaves and bark. One day it will be your turn to bear in mind the coming children, your turn to care for all the living tribes. The list of wild marvels I would save for you is endless. I want you to feel wonder and gratitude for the glories of the earth. I hope you'll come to feel, as I do, that we're already in paradise, right here and now. So.
the nuclear fusion, is that the new thing? No waste because it's not uranium. No waste, no risk of meltdown, no shortage of fuel. It's the good stuff, you know? Am. Is terms of being planted more and more? I believe the answer is yes. I don't have numbers about that, and apparently it can't go anywhere we've, we've been growing wheat before. I don't, I'm not sure whether it's a, a, a sort of more specialized niche. But of course, I don't know about you, but I don't see much wheat of any kind growing around here nowadays. Mm -hmm. I, I did see at one of the co-ops in the cities um, a bin labeled Kurza flower. Okay. And it was empty. It wow. Was rather pricey. Mm -hmm. But interesting. It's available here. That is interesting. And I didn't check before I came, but I think there's a Kernza Festival in Lake City. I think there is. There I think you're right. right. I saw a reference to that. Yeah. And this was before the pandemic. Um, General Mills had made some agreements and were planning on developing some products that would have Kernza in them, but there wasn't enough production to fill oh. yet to fill those hopes of those products they were trying to market. Wow, that's interesting. That synchronization is always delicate, but, but it's nice to think that they are looking to, to build that market. Great. Are there other questions or observations people have? I saw an interesting article uh, this week online, either on the Washington Post or the New York Times, about a worm that they've been working with that will eat clarifone. Oh, wow. All right. <laughs> bon appetit. <laughs> it's it was the most appetizing picture, but um, wow. as you know, styrofoam is yeah. 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 it doesn't go anywhere. So there, there's, that's anywhere. an interesting development on the bug side of things. Yeah. Well, that, that is gratifying. And, you know, it's gratifying to see that there are young people who are taking the climate issue much to heart. I'm, I'm always heartened to see their engagement and their commitment to this. Um, I think it's important for older people to show that we're out there too. I think more younger people than our age are taking it seriously. Yeah, yeah, I think, I think so too. <coughs> That's and really shameful for us. Yeah, I, 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 I would like <coughs> to see it to be universal, really, that we're taking it to heart, but whatever. I, again, things I've recently read have talked about the environmental illiteracy, which is a big problem for um, <coughs> legislation, courts, the people who, who make policy and implement them who, who don't quite get it. I confess that I graduated from a local institution in 1965 with a degree in history, and on that very day, a friend of mine who was a biology major used the word ecology. I'd never heard it. I asked her to explain what it was, and she did. I thought, that sounds important. <laughs> but I didn't know a thing about it in 1965. We have 10, well, eight grandchildren that range in age from three to almost 15 now. They are more aware of, of conservation and repurposing and recycling than my parents ever were. Yeah. Oh, that's great. That yeah. That's terrific. Well, yeah, we yeah. just convince CEOs that survival is more important than greed, we'd be there. Wouldn't that be nice? Mm -hmm. That's great, yeah. I do some volunteering down at uh, the Riverbend Nature Center, and I'm, I'm, the Faribault school systems have their kindergarten through sixth graders on a regular science agenda using the Nature Center. Howard? General Mills got mentioned, and our daughter-in-law is a marketing executive with General Mills. And she, said, she says to me, because we have conversations about this regularly, uh, that sustainability is part of every meeting they have. That's great. Yeah. Well, it's, I was really 
Carla and I have been taking the master recycler class that, that was available last winter, and which will be available next winter as well if you're interested. But that's, I've been so impressed by what's going on. Just coming up here in the not distant future is the lighten up sale at Carlton that will make re recyclable things that the students have cast off at um, low prices. Jan, I, I, I want to thank you for putting a positive spin on a topic that otherwise I think most of us approach with a certain amount of alarm and a certain amount of pessimism. Um, your, I think this is a very, um, I hope it's a contagious way of discussing climate change, but are you concerned that if, if, if you can take 45 minutes to find this many positive things to say, is it going to lessen the urgency in the minds of some listeners? That's, that's a, a really important question. And I, there's got to be a line I don't know how to find bet between are you alarmed and therefore overwhelmed? And are you concerned and therefore engaged? Mm -hmm. and, and boosted? And I don't know how much variation there is among individuals as, as to where that fine point might be. But I would welcome anybody's suggestions about tailoring these remarks more appropriately. What you said earlier, we have to talk to each other. My sister thinks this is a whole lot of media hype. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I told yeah. her she puts the dog in Florida. <laughs> <laughs> they get along great. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> oh my. <laughs> You know, I think it matters, I really do. This is idle speculation on my part, but I imagine most of us here are paying a, a Xcel energy bill, am I right? Mine went up very substantially. And when I made inquiries, I found that it was because the price of natural gas has gone up so substantially. And I'm, I'm, I hope I'm wrong about this, but I had a sneaky suspicion that that big crisis a year ago in Texas had something to do with that. Here you are. <laughs> when you talk about methane, I'm sorry, but yep. you talked about methane earlier. One of the, the unfortunate things I read and learned about was that a huge percentage of the methane that leaks from uh, oil production is coming from the least productive oil wells. And because they're, you know, this is my extrapolation on it, because they're the least pr pr productive, the owners of those wells have the least incentive to take care of them. I've heard the term orphan wells yes. that describes these that are essentially abandoned, let her rip. I don't know what, what can be done to recover methane. I know, I think there are some landfills that have some kind of recovery strategies. I don't believe ours does, but I, I'm, I'm I'm not going to stand by that because I don't know. Also, the melting of the permafrost releases methane, and how do you how do you stop that or capture that? I I am not in a position to know that, but it's it's certainly something that. Well, on the bright side, there's always something we need to do <laughs> to address it. We can't be bored. Your point about whether we, whether we kid ourselves if we hear the good news too much. That's the thing too, uh, we were talking about this at the recycling, about the lighten up sale. Does a, a student thinking, oh, this is gonna go into the sale and it'll find a new home, I can con keep consuming. Or whether they get back to the point where reduce, reuse, repair, recycle. They're really four now, I think. but. Um, those are the things we, we need to take seriously. And we're voters with every choice we make about what we're doing and not doing. And yes, it's important to be voting in November, but we're voting all day, every day, too. And we ought to be factoring that. Okay. So thank you so much for your interest in this. And <laughs>